In this episode, we're heading to Rewild and Coombs Head in Devon, home to Keep It Wild. Keep It Wild runs the Species Recovery Centre, which supports and supplies animals to many of the UK's leading nature recovery, rewilding and reintroduction projects. The site is home to species like beaver, wildcat, black grouse, white storks, water voles, cranes and turtle doves. And excitingly, Coombs had recently welcomed three non-breeding lynx as part of their education programme. I'm meeting with Nick Viney, one of the Keep It Wild founders, who will take us behind the scenes to explore the incredible work they're doing to restore nature. In this first video of the two-part episode, we'll be looking at beavers. So I'd love to just start with yeah, a bit of background about uh, the farm here and sort of how it came to being. Okay, so this is, um, we're actually on Derek Gow's farm um, and Derek is one of the founding members of Keep It Wild. It was a fairly intensive sheep farm. Gradually, as Derek's kind of conservation and species reintroduction um, side grew, we've gradually diminished the conventional livestock, our uh, moving animals um, and having animals on the land in a very different way. As far as land maintenance goes, we still have cows, we have ponies, there's beavers in an enclosure, but there's also free living beavers. We're in the upper parts of the Tamar catchment of the Tamar, so there's beavers in there. Amazing. Um, and then there's all our suite of native animals that we're breeding for reintroduction projects. I have a conventional farming background. I grew up on the edge of Dartmoor in a, in a small mixed farm, really quite conventional. Set stocking with, with livestock, which is keeping a set number of animals on a set amount of land for pretty much all the time. Things changed for me and I had to destock. I saw a change in the landscape that I had never seen in, in my lifetime and the penny kind of dropped for me that perhaps there was another way of doing things, a much more sensitive way of doing things. I have to be doing the responsible thing with that bit yeah. of land. So, and that obviously changes for different people's context, but I'm, that's the driving thing for me now. Yeah. In terms of Keep It Wild, I'd met Derek through surveying old water vole habitat. We kind of got on well, got to know each other, and, um, and then we decided to form Keep It Wild, which was a mechanism as a CIC um, to try and stabilise the work that Derek has been doing for years, but off his own back um, yeah. with his own you know, finances. We just wanted to try and shore that up and make sure all these projects you know, had, a, had a long life going forward. It is Keep It Wild a way of kind of helping scale up some of the work that Derek started here. Yeah, Keep It Wild is definitely a way of, of helping to um, shore up those projects and scale them. Yeah. Derek has been, the, you know, he's really perfected water vole breeding you're going to make mistakes at the beginning. But these creatures that we're dealing with are in such dire straits now that if we yeah. don't act, mm -hmm. um, they'll, they'll be gone. Yeah. So we have to be very decisive and we have to try and, and fail and not be afraid to try again. You know, De Derek's producing thousands of water bowls a year now under a very good system. So yeah, hopefully we can replicate that. You scratch the surface on a lot of the rewilding projects up and down the country and either Keep It Wild or, or Derek Gat Consultancy will, will be in there somewhere, whether it's feasibility studies for the, for the, the white storks at NEP or, or yeah, many, many projects up and down the country. So like most of our fields in the UK, that we have extensive field drain systems uh, and they can be like six foot down and, and you know you might have lived there all your life and not had anything to do with their drains but they're taking the water away. These would be medieval drain systems that we're about to look at. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, so this was a grange, it was all part of the monastery. I mean it's just crazy to think that they had, in the medieval ages they had drain, you know, drainage technology. What was it for agriculture or? Yeah, so draining the land was all yeah. about reclaiming it from nature, um, you know, for agriculture. Yeah. So the, what these beavers have done here is they've said, thank you for this drainage ditch. Yeah. We know what to do with that. Everything you see now is all beaver related. You just wouldn't spot oh, it. Oh wow. They, you know, beavers can be in the landscape for, for a decade and people don't even know they're there. Yeah, oh look, there's one, this is, this is a dam here. Yeah. I mean, it's seriously impressive. 
Yeah, they're, they're, they're incredible engineers and they, you know, they work as a family and the kids get right into it as soon as they can swim and they work all night for free. So mm. why wouldn't we want them part of a natural flood management system? And what it's done for this site is taken us from, for example, the, the small red damselfly. Um, we recorded about three back in 2019 or something like that. Um, we, we, then, we now have the highest count of small red damselfly. We're, you know, we're over 600 or something um, in the survey. So, and that, and that's down to the beavers. That's triggered by the yeah. activity as well. This is an interesting bit of woodland that I find quite primeval, the way the willow's reacting. You'll see beavers taking notches out of trees, testing them, and a tree will push up a lot of a whole load of verticals to it's almost like they know they're in, you know, they're around yeah. and what's about to happen. So this would be quite a regular little ditch that would run down the side of a field. And so the beavers have taken advantage of this and they only have to make a tiny little narrow dam here to really hold the water up. It's not about completely stopping the water, they're not worried about that, these are leaky dams, but it's about slowing the water and giving them enough depth of water that they can escape from their predators. In their mind, there's still wolves and bear and lynx here chomping them. Amazing. So this is really distinctive of beavers, so when you see yeah. this in your waterways, you know there's they're a sharp around. Teeth. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. They just build and they build and they build. They're not generally doing stuff like this overnight. Yeah. Although they, they, they do build dams overnight. They move up and down the, the water system and, you know, and are patching and, and mm. repairing as they go. So we're here, we have a pond that was dug about 10 years ago and there's a this, this is actually where we run our beaver watches from. There's a tiny trickle of water coming in just behind us and the beavers have created this incredible terrace as the, as the sort of slope goes down the hill. We've got maybe 10 different ponds um, and an extraordinary amount of water being held back. So the, the, the dam is down, is at the other side there? Or? Well, this was actually a pond, so they haven't actually had to dam any of this. But when we go over and have a look at the back, um, we'll just see, see some of their damming skills. You can come here, we sit in the hides and watch beavers milling about here, bringing back food, um, construct, you know, altering the edges, dredging clay from the bottom. So it's, yeah, they're, they're an extraordinary animal to watch. Very, um, very sociable and very skilled with, yeah. with willow and clay. When do they come out? What's the time? So they're what's called crepuscular, which is um, dusk until dawn. So there was just a tiny trickle of water that came in off this bit of wet ground up here. And then we'll go down around the corner and see what beavers have managed to do with that tiny trickle. This is them making canals. So they, they adjust the levels of their ponds so they can push water further and, and get further out into the landscape. Amazing, it's really cool. I had no idea they had kind of canals connecting up. I don't know if you've ever seen their feet, but they've, they've got big web feet at the back um, and little hands at the front. Um, and they're sort of, you know, quite wobbly on, on dry land, so they like to um, scoot about through these little canals. You can see these haul out points here. Oh, yeah. And this, this edge, this clay edge that you can see, I mean, that's a dam there. So this, oh, wow. that's, they've built all that. And if you kind of look over the dam, you can see that we're kind of 12 foot above the next water point. So they're holding back all this water. Amazing. Everything loves beavers. They, the, the biodiversity levels just rocket when beavers uh, arrive because they slow this water and there's something to do with the, the biology and, and how they interact with other creatures, but they're like a magnet to, to, 
you know, to other creatures. So your dragonfly population rockets, your frog population rockets, rockets. So so then you're bringing in more birds. Um, so as as complex as it looks, and it does <laughs> when we look down the corner, they're actually coppicing, and you know these trees, especially like willow. Those you know willow and beaver coexisted and really are like a duet in the landscape. You know they rely on each other. You know the willow for healthy fresh growth, um, and the you know the beaver to feed on that and to work with that. So yeah, they're incredible engineers. We'll have a look down here. So this is where the beavers have, have come out. I mean, a month ago, this wasn't even here. So they've, they're ah. pushing the water right out to this boundary so that they can forage right out to here, but as close to water as, you know, as they can be. And this has just changed dramatically. You, I mean, you have to come every day. Uh, in terms of climate change, this is really an animal that we, we need back urgently. Water security is the is the number one thing we need to be thinking about um, because everything else comes off the back of that. And, you know, so with water security, then we, we secure our food, um, we improve our biodiversity um, and we can start to get things back in balance again. They've, they've had a go at this big tree. <laughs> they've had a go at this big tree. They've, got, they've lost interest. They've moved on to something else. But, I mean, all these willow that you can see are horizontal. Yeah. I mean, this is, we really need more dead wood in the landscape for a start mm. um, for many reasons, whether that's fungal, um, whether that's habitat. They really kickstart this um, succession progress. So you can, you can see, you know, you've got trees dying, you've got trees growing, you've got the whole kind of gambit of tree life going on. And here you can see this beautiful little dam. No, it's not a little dam actually, it's a really, no, it's 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 a really big dam. But so they, they put mud, they kind so, of have sticks and then they sort of add the mud to, to waterproof it. Exactly, yeah. So they, so they dredge from the bottom and you'll see them on the camera trap footage, um, you know, carrying, they, they'll come up from the bottom, they'll have two handfuls of, of clay and then they'll go towards the, the dam and then they'll start placing this um, in, a, you know, in a very organised way. It's really, really impressive Amazing. and beautiful to watch. So at the moment, beavers that we translocate with, um, in conjunction with the Beaver Trust, those animals are going into licensed enclosures. Even though just down in the valley there are free living beavers, um, at the moment the, the policy states that um, once they are translocated they can only go into licensed enclosures. So as they flood this area, they make their haul out points. This is quite fresh here, these, these chips. It's beautiful. There's something very, very interesting and almost primeval, I find, about these wetlands. Well, it's just rare to see any sort of wetland areas in the UK, isn't it? Yeah. Willow Carb is one that I recently learned about at High Fen, which was really beautiful. I was here just three days ago and They've completely changed this dam now. They've really worked on this dam. You can see how that tree's under, undermined there and you can see the very recent work on top there. Amazing. Thank you for watching the first part of this episode. I hope you can join us again for the second part where we'll be looking at all of the incredible work they're doing at Coombshead with other species, including their latest lynx arrivals. An animal that used to roam wild in the UK one and a half thousand years ago before going extinct. Look forward to seeing you soon.